Jesu. Well, uh, hello everybody. Um, I won't try the Icelandic. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And I have always been a huge admirer of, of the Wellbeing Economy Government Alliance. Uh, I think this is the leadership that we need and we're going to need even, even more in the future. I'm hoping that the country I come from um, is going to join in this. Um, you might have heard that we might be going to have a change of government uh, in Britain in the next uh, couple of years. And the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, uh, has promised that if he is elected, he will require the Treasury, the Treasury Department, Finance Department, when it is uh, appraising bids for money from all the different departments, to judge these bids by their impact on well-being, as well as on GDP. So this would be a huge uh, step forward. Uh, and what I thought I would talk about today is how do we actually uh, arrange our thoughts about what are the priorities if well-being is the objective. Uh, and I want to suggest four principles for the well-being movement in government. So. So number one, we will not make progress unless we have a single measure of benefit. Uh, the, the many reasons for this. Uh, the first is simply logical, that if you have to choose between a whole set of different uh, alternative policies, and you're ranking them by, let's say, two criteria, and one policy does better on one, and another does better on another, how do you resolve it? So you can only resolve it if you can give weights to the two criteria. How do you give weights to the two criteria? It must be in terms of the impact which those two have on some overarching criterion. It's a very simple logical point that for any form of coherent decision making, there can only be one outcome by which you're judging everything. And I think we should face up to that essential logical problem. It's not enough to have dashboards or pillars. We have got to commit ourselves uh, to that one uh, uh, need for a single criterion. Now, what should it be? Um, I think it should be uh, how people feel about their lives. Um, this is the question which has been most often asked. Overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? It's been asked for about 70 years in many countries. Uh, we understand it very well. People understand the question. It's one of the questions they ask the quickest in a questionnaire because they re people really know uh, uh, how they feel. But, but how, how would I justify that to somebody who said, well, why are you saying that that is the thing that matters most? And, and this is how I would do it. And I think it's important that we, uh, we all have a, an argument to give to people who are skeptical. Uh, so I would do it this way. I would say there are many things that are good. Health is good, wealth is good, freedom is good. But why are they good? You can give some answer. Wealth is good because it enables you to have a more enjoyable life. Health is good because you feel terrible if you're sick. Freedom is good, you feel terrible if your life is controlled by uh, other people. But if you ask, why does it matter how you feel? There's no answer. We just know it. So that is implicitly the overriding good for human beings. It's how they feel. It is subjective well-being. And we should commit ourselves to this idea, because unless we have a common voice with which we answer the skeptics, uh, we're never going to get uh, to where we want uh, to get to. And I think that this... Uh, Life satisfaction uh, definition is very good. It's very simple. It's clear. Everybody knows what the question is, which you're using. It's not, not an index devised by some researchers. Uh, it's also democratic because it's not researchers saying, well, this person has got A, B, C, and D. We rank them high. Uh, their life is thriving. No. We ask the person, is your life thriving or not? People know. And there is, of course, 
um, a huge information content in the answers that people give. So here are just some of the things which are highly correlated with these answers. First, it's a very good predictor of other things. It is one of the best predictors of how long you will live. Just that simple question is almost as good a predictor of whether you'll be alive in 10 years' time uh, as a complete medical examination and a diagnosis. Uh, that's remarkable, isn't it? Answer to a single question has such predictive power. It's a good predictive power, of course, of whether you'll leave your job, your spouse, etc. But here's also what's very important from the point of view of getting politicians to take this seriously. It is a good predictor of whether people will vote for the existing government. Uh, and a colleague of mine has uh, done a number of remarkable studies, uh, taking uh, national elections in all European countries for the last uh, 50 years and seeing what is the best predictor of the share of the vote obtained by the governing party or parties. And of course, uh, Bill Clinton said it's the economy stupid, but he's wrong. It's well-being stupid. Well-being does better than the economy in predicting how people will vote for the obvious reason, which I think is why we're all here. The economy is just a part of well-being, uh, but it's not uh, the, the only, uh, maybe not even, as I'll say in a second, not even maybe the most dominating part. <coughs> so I've given reasons for having a single measure uh, that it resolves the logical problem, uh, that it's clear. Um, and I want to add one simple thought, which is the politics of this. The, the concept of economic growth is simple. If you want, and it's wrong, <laughs> as a single, as the overarching objective. It's an important objective, but it's not the only one. If you want to get rid of a, a single bad idea, you are only likely to succeed if you replace it by a single good idea. And the, a, a big, big problem of this well-being movement is people say it's fuzzy, we don't know what it means, different people have got different scales, indices, pillars, dashboards. We need to get beyond that. It's a single concept. How are people feeling about their lives? What is the experience? quality of life, we, we need a, a range of words to describe that ultimate inner feeling about how your life is, is going. So that's, of course, the quality of life in one particular year by year. Uh, obviously, the length of life is also very important. So the, the second very obvious point is we have to take into account the effect of a policy choice on the length of life as well as the quality of life. Um, this is already done in the medical profession. Um, the concept of qualities, uh, quality of life adjusted years um, has been used, well now it's absolutely routine practice, uh, legally required practice in Britain. Uh, what treatments can be provided depends on the qualities satisfying uh, some cross criterion. Um, and it's used of course in many other many, many other countries. So it's a, it's a very simple precedent for what we are trying to argue for. But we're trying to argue for something which applies not just to what they call health-related quality of life, but the overall quality of life. Uh, we are asking for something that, of course, relates to um, the evaluation of all policies, not just health interventions. And we're also interested in looking at the impact um, on everybody who's affected, not just a patient or some particular immediate target group, but everybody else who's affected as well in the family uh, and in the community. So this is another good thing on our side. Here is a well-established concept which we can generalize, uh, and we're not going into completely uncharted territory. We can point to the success of this um, within the health field. Um, so coming back to uh, the challenge of um, how to do well-being budgeting, uh, ob ob 
Oops. Obviously, uh, what we're trying to do is, is to maximize the total change in these well-being life years um, which um, are generated uh, as a result of our choices. Uh, obviously, they are a stream of uh, well-being life years for everybody who's going to be affected now and into the future. Future generations matter a lot. Discount rate small. We're trying to maximize that given that we only have so much money. And uh, I think we should be absolutely clear, this well-being uh, argument should not be used and cannot be used to determine the size of the budget. This is a political issue. So the, the intellectual challenge is to make the best well-being outcome given the size of the budget. And that means, of course, that you are to judge policies um, by the total number of these well-being years which they generate relative to the net cost they have to the budget. And of course, we often have arguments about uh, something where we spend money now and it saves money later. All of that goes into the bottom half of this ratio. So we, we, we rank policies by this ratio uh, and uh, then we undertake uh, the, the best policies until the money is exhausted. Uh, and so that's, that's a simple way of explaining what we're trying to do uh, in well-being budgeting. Um, of course, just to say that doesn't mean it's easy to do. <laughs> and we, 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 are, we are feeling under a bit of a challenge in, in, in Britain uh, at the thought that we may have a government that wants to do this in two years' time, so we're all busy working um, at providing uh, numerical values that can be used uh, to do this type of evaluation. And, and I'm, I'm excited at the idea that well-being budgeting is, is, is sort of weaving its way into uh, thinking in this country as well. And I, I hope maybe we can work together uh, a bit on that. <coughs> so the final, final principle um, is we are not just concerned um, with well-being, whoever they accrue to. We are particularly concerned, and this is one reason we have governments, to protect the unfortunate. Um, so we are particularly interested in reducing the levels of misery in our societies. And I think the simplest way to think about this is that we obviously need to identify those areas of life which are causing the most misery uh, and uh, particularly develop new policies uh, in that uh, direction towards those areas of life. So how do we identify those areas of life? We've talked about this a bit already this morning, but um, the kind of approach which we have adopted is using these surveys. You know uh, the per person's life satisfaction. You take uh, a certain cutoff and you say people below this are miserable. So there's a, 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 a something to be explained. Is a person miserable or not? And then you know all these other things about somebody and you estimate a relationship between whether a person is miserable and all these other uh, variables. Uh, here are the main variables that we have included. So mental health jumps out as the biggest single factor explaining uh, uh, why a person is likely to be miserable. And this is a very simple variable. Uh, simply, have you ever been diagnosed uh, with an anxiety disorder uh, or a depression? Uh, that is remarkable, the influence of that on the likelihood of your being miserable at this moment. Physical health problems also, of course. Uh, having no partner, no, no good uh, family life, important. Um, having a, a unsatisfactory work, uh, particularly in bad relations, boring, difficult, dangerous work, being unemployed, 
being poor, um, is down there. So being poor is important, but we, we have to get away from the idea that poverty is the, more or less the equivalent of misery, and misery is the equivalent of poverty. There are so many other causes of misery which governments can deal with. Mental health, uh, people have mentioned uh, family uh, violence, loneliness, so many other problems uh, which now with the evidence base that we have and the tools that we have, uh, governments can uh, address. Just remember, I think that one important thing to remember is that governments used to do very little more than just defend the country and maintain law and order. And bit by bit, through the accumulation of knowledge, governments have been able to take on other roles. And we are, we must be clear about this, uh, advocating a more proactive uh, role for governments in many of these areas which were previously thought of as private matters or matters for religious organizations. These are things that government uh, can play a major, a major, major role. So, um, just before I go on, I, I just want to say one other thing. Um, if you don't like equations, <laughs> some people will say, well, well not all that. You can ask people directly, what are the things that you most worry about in your daily life? And they're not the things that most politicians, in Britain anyway, think. Again, they're exactly the same order. Income and uh, the, the heading called income or debt is number six in Britain. I don't say that's this true this very year because economics has an unusual importance uh, in this uh, cost of living crisis year. But in general, if we're thinking about things, we've got to get uh, income into the right perspective. It, it does matter. Income inequality does matter because one of the other findings from wellbeing research is that the, the, the value of an extra uh, dollar or krona uh, to a, an individual uh, matters less the richer the person uh, already is. Uh, in fact, it, it diminishes very sharply. Uh, so here's the rule, that if somebody, uh, if, if you take a poor person, um, an, an extra krona is worth 10 times more to them than it is to somebody who's 10 times richer than them. It's, it's inversely proportional uh, to a person's existing wealth, uh, how much benefit they get from money uh, in terms of their well-being. Uh, so that's a very important argument for redistribution. Uh, it was always used, incidentally, by economists before we had well-being science, but no well-being science can actually provide that functional uh, form and that uh, estimate. Okay, so let, let me just uh, end by uh, uh, saying a little bit about um, what sort of things, additional priorities come up. Uh, we've already talked about some of these, but mental health is obviously one, and I, I, I will just mention this program, um, which um, I was involved in uh, uh, mounting. Uh, you, you probably know roughly 16% of the population, adult population, is suffering from anxiety disorders or depression of a diagnosable uh, severity. Um, and in every country, uh, the majority of those people are getting no treatment. Uh, this is completely different from physical illness, most of which is get some sort of treatment. Uh, most mental illness, uh, except for... Uh, psychotic uh, mental illness, most, most mental illness is not treated. I and mean, this is incredibly discriminatory uh, aspect of public policy. Um, so we made the case that uh, the uh, psychological therapies which are effective and recommended by our guidelines, government guidelines, should actually be implemented. Um, we also pointed out, which always helps, that uh, this will save more money than it costs. <laughs> uh, and we now have a service which is uh, treating 700,000 people. 55% um, 
um, uh, recovery during the period of treatment um, with um, a halving of the rate of relapse for people recovering from uh, depression. Uh, a number of other countries, uh, including I think Norway and Finland, um, have been copying this. And I believe that the, David Clark is discussing with, with someone uh, here uh, possible interest in, in this country. That, I, I, I strongly recommend that. Um, obviously, prevention is better than cure. Uh, so clearly, we should have the well-being goal as an explicit goal of school education. Uh, and to make that work, uh, we should be measuring the well-being of children in schools and seeing how that is progressing and what the school is doing uh, for their children. Um, this will affect, obviously, all, all aspects of the school life to try and bring that uh, about. Uh, but in particular, there should be a weekly life skills lesson based on evidence-based materials. Uh, we were in <coughs> involved in a, a successful trial for people aged 11 to 15 called Healthy Minds, but there are many other good programs. But uh, you can show that these well-structured and manualized ways of teaching life skills are more effective than uh, someone, uh, a teacher, just uh, thinking it up for themselves. Uh, I, I put vocational education there. I think that is the most important area in reducing income inequality uh, and uh, unemployment. Uh, and some countries do it better than others. Uh, elderly care loneliness is an incredible source of uh, unhappiness, as, of course, is, is uh, untreated and unsupported ill health. And then, as everybody has said, climate change is crucial for well-being. It's the central thing for the well-being of future generations. So how iconoclastic is this program that I've been talking about? It's not iconoclastic at all. Um, uh, to those of you who are economists here, as I am, um, this is simply, in fact, I wrote a textbook on cost-benefit analysis once. This is simply an extension of cost-benefit analysis into areas where it, it, the existing type of cost-benefit analysis um, has not been feasible because there's no evidence of willingness to pay that throws light on um, how important it is how you feel if you're sick or something like this. So it's, it's a simple extension using direct evidence on well-being um, to complement areas where you can get meaningful measures of benefit in terms of money. And you can compare the, compare the two, of course, because we know what is the impact of money uh, on well-being, and that enables us to have a unified uh, approach to this whole area. Do we have enough evidence to do this well-being budgeting? I think we do now. I mean, it's a, of course we will learn by doing. Uh, we need to have uh, more experiments. We, we always need more experiments to get good, good policies. And every single experiment should always measure well-being as an outcome. But we have a huge body of knowledge with many, many coefficients in these references here, which are listed at the end of uh, the slide deck. Um, and um, a, a, a lot of this is, is, is summarized in this book. I'm allowed to do some advertising, I hope. <laughs> um, I thought, when the lockdown struck, um, that it was time that we had a, a textbook on well-being science, because there wasn't one. Uh, and I palled up with my colleague, uh, Jan de Neve, and uh, we produced uh, this textbook, which has got a, a lot of the numbers in, but you need some more from what I just quoted, to, to do effective uh, well-being uh, budgeting. So Cambridge University Press uh, are pushing this out as a field-defining textbook. And I think we do need this as a field, which is also taught in universities and so on. Um, we, we, you can't read the endorsement. I have to look 
tightly. But Daniel Kahneman said, this is the best book I've read in a long time. Uh, so uh, if, if you're interested in getting into this subject, um, you might like to have a look at that. So I think we can make uh, this fundamental shift in our priorities uh, by ha having a fundamental shift in our thinking, um, provided the politicians want it. Um, we've got a lot of civil servants in Britain who want it, um, but not many politicians are in the governing party. Um, so I think there are two things that are wanted. Um, f first, uh, th we need public opinion. We need to mobilize public opinion. Politicians can't really operate without public opinion uh, behind them. They can't run that far ahead. So this is one step that we've taken um, to uh, try to mobilize public opinion worldwide. This is the World Happiness Summit that happened in Como recently. So we issued this manifesto. Uh, this is how it begins. It is time to reappraise the goal for our society. The goal should be people's well-being, their enjoyment of life, their sense of satisfaction and of fulfillment. We need to aim at the noble enlightenment ideal of well-being. Let's put well-being first. So I would say that's, that we, we need a slogan for this movement as well. So this is the best we could come up with. Let's put well-being first. And if any of you feel strongly, uh, please sign this manifesto, which you can access at that uh, website. Um, but in the end, of course, this is all down to governments. Uh, and whoops, and, and it, it is very important, uh, we were talking about it before, uh, that we have this big reappraisal moment coming uh, at the instigation of the UN Secretary General in 2024, his summit of the future. And I do think it would be terrific um, if we could persuade uh, governments to say, at very least, that well-being is a central goal. <laughs> Even if they don't want to say it's the central goal. Could, could we not, through your, your great well-being government, uh, well-being economy government group, could you not take this, the lead in trying to press for that to be in the uh, resolutions coming out of that summit of the future? Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a group of us who are editors of the World Happiness Report. We, we are happy to help on this. Um, but I think it would be a, a wonderful outcome of this conference if, if, if there could be a real push uh, to get governments worldwide to say that, at the least, well-being is a central purpose of their governments. Thank you very much.